welcome. I am seeing names flood in, uh, including some uh, current and former Swan Galleries uh, employees, including David Rivera. Hi, David. <laughs> David. Uh, lots of familiar names in the audience tonight. So welcome everybody. Um, we are already at a, um, over a hundred attendees right now. So they're gonna keep coming in. Um, welcome to Swan, uh, another Swan Salon online. Um, only one of us is at Swan and that's Deborah Rogel. Hi Deb. <laughs> um, the rest of us are broadcasting to you from our homes. Uh, and I'm Alex, I'm the CMO at Swan Galleries. Um, and I'm just here to mostly welcome you and say hi. Thank you for coming. Um, we have a really great event for you tonight. So I think that I'm, I'm actually putting money on the fact that 99%, maybe 99.9% .9 of the people in this, uh, if that was even possible, are, they're gonna know who Swan is. So I'm gonna just, I'm gonna gloss over like so much. Swan is an auction house. We have been in business now 80 years, um, which is just amazing. And, but, you know, Deb pointed out to me uh, last year at some point that the, there's another really big milestone this year. And that is, the 70th anniversary of the Marshall sale. We will get into what the Marshall sale was and the um, importance of that. But uh, the Marshall sale is marks 70 years of photographs auctions um, in the United States and specifically at Swan. And so we have here uh, three photo dynamos, I don't know how else to say it, um, from Swan's past and present. So uh, hi, Denise. Uh, Denise Bethel um, uh, joined Swan in 1980 and in 1990 uh, and worked in the photo department, ran the photo department. Um, and then in 1990, Denise moved to Sotheby's and was there for 25 years. Um, so welcome, Denise. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us. Uh, Dale Kaplan. Um, Dale, what, Dale, what can I say? Hi, Dale. <laughs> Dale uh, <laughs> ran the photo department at Swan Galleries for 30 years um, and uh, was vice president at Swan, an auctioneer. Denise was also an auctioneer as well. Um, Dale now runs uh, her own appraisal business. Um, it's a delight to have you, Dale. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And finally, Deborah Rogel is our current director of photographs at Swan and the mastermind behind, behind the proceedings this evening. So I am going to hand it over to Deb to uh, start off our conversation, um, folks, uh, in just one second. There is a Q&A button somewhere in your Zoom window. If you have questions for these wonderful women, please throw the questions in the Q&A. Uh, please feel free to give us a shout out. I love swan anecdotes. So if you have a swan anecdote, you can throw that in the chat um, and everybody will see it. And um, no further ado, Deb, take it away. Thank you. Alex, um, and thank you all for coming to our virtual event. I'm here at Swan, so I feel like you're all here with me in the sales room. Um, I'm so glad to be celebrating 70 years since the Marshall sale, the first photo sale at Swan and anywhere in the States. Um, I feel really lucky to play just a really small role in the history of the department at Swan, and I'm really, really excited for tonight to have Denise and Dale here with us. Um, you know, at Swan, we've been lucky to have a department first helmed by David Margolis, then Denise, then Dale. And it's really hard to overstate Denise's and Dale's importance to the photo market. Um, you know, as this event has come together and I've been talking to people about having them both with us, um, 
everyone just has a very personal story about how they Denise and Dale changed collecting, changed their way they look at photographs, changed the direction of the whole market. Um, and having worked with Dale for a long time, from 2006 to 2020, I witnessed that, if not every day, every week. So I'm excited to speak to both of them. Just one quick, exciting thing. We've reissued the Marshall Sale Catalog. Mm -hmm. um, this is the third edition, if you're a collector. Um, it's an edition of 200 copies, so it's kind of special, but it's a direct facsimile of that original first catalog with a new intro and also with the pretty astonishing prices realized in the back, which we might hear more about from Denise, but here they are. So if you come by Swan at all, happy to share this. Um, and it's pretty great to be able to reissue that um, since the original is quite rare and the um, 1978 facsimile is also hard to find these days. Um, so I don't want to talk too much myself. I would like to turn directly to um, Dale and Denise and Denise first to you, just to talk a little bit about what the department was like in 1980, what sales were like when you first arrived, and if you can just talk about those early years as one. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I joined Swan in 1980, and I'd like to talk a little bit um, before I talk about my a stint at Swan, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about David Margolis. So um, Mr. Halbmeyer, Edwin Halbmeyer, the senior book cataloger at Swan, um, cataloged the Marshall sale in 1952. And he was the senior book, I mean, he was, the, he was essentially the cataloger at Swan um, from the time he arrived in 1943 until he retired in 1984. David Margolis um, came aboard at Swan in 1975. And he had a background. He uh, was a gra Pratt graduate. He got his MFA in Philadelphia. He was a photographer. Um, he was a graphic designer. Um, he had done a lot of really interesting things um, after he got his MFA before he came to uh, Swan in 1975. Um, but I actually got David on tape back in the 90s, in the early 90s, and uh, I was listening to it, and he said uh, some things that I'm, I'm glad he did, because it kind of explains why Swan got back into the business of selling photographs. Um, <clears throat> when he came to Swan in 1975, he came as a, a person who would um, you know, kind of work generally, but also he was the person who put the sales up, who pulled the books and put the sales up. And uh, Swan had noticed that when photo items showed up in the sales, um, they attracted some attention that other things weren't getting. And so George Lowry um, asked David if he thought maybe it was time to pull some photo sales together. Um, and so from 1975 to 1979, um, that's what David did. And he also, and this is important to my career, he also was the person who did the map sales, the prints and drawing sales, anything that had a picture, um, he did, he was like that person. And the reason I say it's important to me is that when I came aboard uh, in 1980, I not only was the photo person, um, I did two photo sales a year, but then I also did two map sales a year, two prints and drawing sales a year. And when I said, oh my God, they said, well, that David did that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess that was part of my, my deal. Um, anyway, David, um, I think David, uh, if you look back at those early catalogs, David really, he, he set a tone and a scope for Swan catalogs that I think has continued to this day. So if you look at, at, at uh, the facsimile of the Marshall sale, um, that is very much a bookseller's catalog. Mr. Halmeyer did a wonderful job uh, using 
what few books, I mean, Gernsheim was not even in existence in 1952. The first edition of Gernsheim didn't come out until 54. I think he had a copy of Taft. He had Marshall's notes, um, but it's, it's a bookseller's catalog uh, because Marshall had bought many of the things from booksellers. Um, David brought a visual sensibility to the photo sales. Um, he also, David has a great sense of humor. So he kind of set the tone in the way he cataloged certain things, which I tried to emulate. And I think, you know, that is something that's a kind of niche that, that sets Swan apart. Um, so anyway, I came aboard in uh, 19, 1980 and I brought my, the reason I, I brought my little facsimile because to welcome me to Swan, Mr. Haubmeier um, inscribed it, but he could write backwards. <laughs> so if you hold this up to the mirror, it says photography is art in reverse. And then he signed it. So this is something I'm absolutely thrilled to have. Um, there was, uh, there was such a different way of looking at photographs when I came um, to, to Swan. First of all, they'd always been part of book sales. And for those of you who are photo historians and are kind of trying to find things in Swan catalogs, um, I need to tip you off to something. Before I got to Swan, and even my first couple of years at Swan, um, great photography items were pulled from the photography sales and put into something called the fine sales. Now, Swan had two fine sales a year. What a fine sale was, um, was things that had great things from every category that Swan sold pulled together for one great sale in the fall and in the spring. So for instance, I'm sure you all have heard uh, about two Watkins albums that were sold at Swan in 1979. This was something that set the photo world on fire. They were two mammoth plate Watkins albums uh, that had come from the university club and one sold for 98,000. 50, about 50 pictures, the other about 50 pictures sold for 100,000. Mm -hmm. And these were just astounding prices for photography in 1979. But if you go back and look for those in the 1979 catalogs, you won't find them in the photography catalogs because they were pulled from the photography sales and put into something called the fine sale. When I got to Swan, this was still happening. And after about a year or two of this, I was like, uh-uh, I've got to have those things. I've got to have the expensive photography things to bolster um, what we're doing in photography. Um, and, and George agreed. So from, I brought, I just want to, for, for your old timers, you'll remember this. So when I started at Swan, um, when David cataloged, when I cataloged, things were called photographica. I'm sure you will all remember this. Um, things at Swan were cataloged in Photographica sales from 1975 to 1985. And so this is a catalog that I did from 1985. You can see this uh, photogram on the front. This is not Photographica. This is something completely different. This is what we would call fine art photography. And so in 1985, um, by the fall, we switched it to photography. And it was photography until 1988. And then in 1988, we switched it to photographs. And I think this whole evolution from photographica to photography to photographs um, was important for Swan, but it was also important for the market. Um, we were selling legitimate fine art photographs um, the whole time I was at Swan, the time that David was at Swan. Um, in 1985, um, I became an auctioneer 
And uh, two things uh, stick out in my mind from 1985, which was mid-career for me. Um, in the spring, Swan had the top lot of the photo sales that were taking place at Sotheby's, Christie's, I guess Phillips was still in the game then at Swan. Um, we were selling, Lee Whitkin's material came to auction. The photographs went to Sotheby's, the books went to Swan, came to Swan, and we sold um, an extra illustrated copy of a book by Henry James called A Little Tour in France that had 33 extra illustrations, all original platinum prints that were in the book um, for $30,000. And that was the, the hammer. And that was the top lot in the spring of 1985 of all the auction houses. And then in the fall, um, we had the Brady daguerreotype, um, which sold to the National Portrait Gallery. The hammer on that was 54,000 and again, that was the top lot for the fall sales for all of the auction houses. And so bolstered by this um, uh, new influx of record prices, I went to George and I said, look, you've got to hire somebody else to do the prints and photographs. I, I mean, to do the prints and maps and drawings. I can't do this anymore. By that time, we were making so much money in photography. I think photography was other than the fine sales, photography was probably um, the leading category of sale at Swan at that point. Mm -hmm. And George agreed. And we hired um, a woman named Krista Rosenberg, um, who had worked at a smaller auction house, I think, in Baltimore, um, to come aboard. And uh, I was so glad to relinquish having to do, I mean, it was just crazy doing two photo sales. Um, two print sales, two map sales. And so Krista took over the graphic part of my job. And for the last five years I was at Swan, um, I did nothing but photography. And of course, anybody who was in the market at the time um, will remember that photographs, other than a few dips when we had a recession uh, in the country, uh, photographs have been kind of a straight line uh, up on a graph. And in, 19, um, in 1989, um, I had been offered a job at, at uh, Sotheby's, um, which was a, <laughs> Swan was a one person department. I got some great part-time help from a woman named Maria Umali, who later went on to work at Gilman. Um, but at the time, it, you look back on it, Sotheby's was a two person department, Christie's was a two person department. And when Sotheby's got the Graham Nash sale for the spring of 1990, um, Beth Gates Warren was able to uh, expand the department and I was the expansion. So there were three people instead of two people. Mm -hmm. And I remember going that uh, fall to the Penta show, um, running into Roger Kingston um, and saying, you know, Roger, I'm leaving. And I was telling people that I was leaving and do you know anyone? And Roger said, oh, Dale Kaplan, she is the person. And um, I remember interviewing Dale and now I'm gonna turn it over to Dale. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what a story. Um, thank you for sharing all of that. Thank you, Deb for having me. Um, in terms of a kind of broader picture, 1952, the publication of The Decisive Moment and the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. All right, All right. 1952, <laughs> hallmark year. But let's fast forward to February 1st, 1990, when I started at Swan and I had had opportunities to visit Swan during previews and enjoyed the salon style presentation, floor to ceiling maps, the kind of inundation of books and this feeling of gentility that uh, permeated the place. 
the Swan at that time was such a different kind of environment. You know, Denise, you mentioned the prints and drawings, but when I was first starting, I remember the rare book sales were the big ticket sales. Toby's sales would generate a whopping $500,000. And it was just um, bells and whistles for everyone. And so what I fondly remember in terms of those first months was feeling overwhelmed at the amount of information one had to kind of gather for each and every sale. And George saying to me that the opportunity to build the department was going to be around finding great consignments and recognizing because I overheard it at a preview that Swan was the best kept secret in the auction world. So in relation to finding great consignments and finding new buyers, I recognized that maybe we could do a bit of rebranding and begin to uh, tilt the scales, if you will, towards more 20th century material because as some of you may know, before I was hired by George, I wrote a book about Lewis Hine. And that book uh, really gave me access to a whole world of photography and understanding visual culture that was just really exciting. And so recognizing that Denise's legacy was very much involved with books and albums and folios. And as she has often said, and if you haven't seen her talk at the Frick, I urge you to stream it. It's absolutely wonderful. The photography market really keyed in to the rare book market. And this notion that the display and presentation of photographs was off the wall. In other words, it was flat art, but flat art bound and um, loose in folios. So from my perspective, being this kind of downtown girl and coming up with Barbara Kruger and Cindy Sherman and Sherry Levine, photography had a lot of new potential. And what I remember at Swan is this sense of, well, how can we market ourselves in, remember, a very pre-internet age? And so one of the areas that we focused on was our catalogs and looking at the catalogs and Swan's history as an antiquarian bookhouse as a way to position and platform the photo department in a, let's just say, new way. And so I remember we did this Civil War sale and we hired a designer to uh -oh. actually create uh -oh. a cover <laughs> and to look at the content. And from there, we kind of found AGW, a printer that had been printing Photograph Magazine and brought a kind of production quality to our catalogs that were, that was very different, let's just say, from the rare book or the antiquarian book model. But when I was hired, my role was to, Denise, I'm sorry to say this, to produce two auctions, one in October and one in the spring. And over a period of time, as I began to look at marketing opportunities, I realized, wait a minute, why don't we do a sale in February when the APAD photo fair and all the dealers were in town? 
And that way we would have an opportunity to stand alone rather than be part of photo week, which, you know, by the late 1990s was becoming increasingly crowded, shall we say. So the February sale was my second sale of the year. And I always loved our February sales, Deb, because number one, it was the first color catalog. I mean, all color that we did. And it was an opportunity to curate sales versus this sort of other strategy. So second sale, February, third sale, spring. And then we started to look at this photo literature market and recognized that again, this is part of, of Swan's core identity and dealers were retiring, scholars were moving on. We began to do these sales in December, which would be, I guess, our second sale, February 3rd sale, spring 4th sale. And we actually issued a separate catalog for these sales. Why? To reinforce the idea that photographic literature or photo books, as this genre came to be known in the early 2000s with um, Martin Parr's books, the Hasselblad book, um, Roth's book. And so the catalogs really served as incredibly powerful marketing tools. And then around, I guess, 2005, Swan hired an art director who began creating a look, a style, if you will, to our catalogs that was more editorial, that was more modern, or perhaps I should say postmodern looking. Because when Deb and I were talking about this sort of genesis of the department, and my starting in 1990 and this kind of rebranding, she said, well, 1990, that's 10 years before the new millennium. And Swan is beginning to focus on 20th century photography. But again, the market was first introduced 1969, 1970. So the market is only 20 years old, mm -hmm. but the medium, of course, is much older. I wanna talk just a little bit about the shift that I was seeing in the 1990s as I um, recognized galleries like Yancey Richardson, Nancy Lieberman and Julie Saul, uh, Deborah Bell uh, who came in later, women who began to um, highlight contemporary artists, contemporary photographers, and contributed to this shift of what is photography today. And in the 1990s, photography in the media was referred to as the art form of the 20th century. And so on the East Coast, we have a lot of New York activity. On the West Coast, Rose Shoshana opened her gallery as a not-for-profit space in like 1993. Peter Fetterman eventually opened a gallery, uh, Gail Gibson. And so this focus and this shifting of the sensibility to 20th century photography was very much on our minds in relation to how Swan could reposition itself. And ultimately, I thank Denise for vernacular photography because while I was researching my Lewis Hine books, I had an opportunity to mentee with Alan Trachtenberg, who talked about the vernacular in relation to Lewis Hine. And then when I entered the marketplace and saw Swan's catalogs from the 70s and 80s, and the use and appearance of daguerreotypes, especially anonymous daguerreotypes, and how they had been 
cataloged and um, stratified, if you will, by image content, by quality, by historical context. It's like, wait a minute, everyone's collecting this material. Let's jump in. And maybe there's a way to create a bridge between the classical photography world and the contemporary photography world. That was always my MO. How can we expand and engage new clientele with this wonderful world of photography? And so seeing what you're doing, Deb, and uh, missing you, but recognizing the next D in the equation. All right. <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> David, Denise, Dale, Deborah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so here we are. And, um, and so the vernacular material, and of course, personally, it's transitioned to pop photographica for me has always been fun, but a way of, as I said, expanding our idea of how photography um, fits into visual culture and this larger issue of um, the image and its kind of what continuous evolution uh, culturally, technologically in the trade. And so it, it was thrilling to be part of SWAN. It was just, it was an amazing experience. And mm -hmm. so it's great to be here. <laughs> and, um, well, you know, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about, I mean, I think we've touched on this, but the shift from your time, Denise, in, into the 90s, you Dale, and even, I mean, I think I've even seen some of this since I started at Swan, just the growth of the community of people who are invested in the medium. I think Denise, you've talked on, you know, here and other places about the book community and why the book field kind of gave rise to some of this market. And that at the Marshall sale, it was book dealers maybe who were a big part of that, both from the impetus for Marshall's collection and also just the buyers at that sale. Um, but then how did that shift and when did that shift towards personal collecting? You know, I think Dale touched on something that I love about the medium, which is that we all identify so closely with making images, seeing images around us all the time. Um, and I just wonder if both of you maybe can talk a little bit about, about that. You want to start, Denise, in uh, terms I mean, of? Yeah, I, um, you know, what's uh, one of the points that I've made uh, in talks uh, and articles before this is that when we think of photography being sold in the 19th and first half of the 20th century, um, there it was, it would, there, it, paintings people by and large were ignoring photography. I mean, photography wasn't a fine art. Mm -hmm. um, you have a few exceptions to that. You have Julian Levy, um, who was uh, had an art gallery who showed photography, but you don't. Most of the people who were preserving photography and selling it um, were book dealers. Um, print dealers even were not really handling it in the 19th and early part of the 20th century. Um, I think that book dealers uh, who had a different perspective on history, on uh, what was worth preserving. I mean, I heard Helmut Gernsheim say at one point uh, at one of the APAD affairs, that if it hadn't been for the book dealers, a lot of the history of photography would have just been thrown away because it was an art. So I think we are um, in the marketplace looking at a transition, not only um, for the type of person who was handling photography, but um, one has to take into account the status of photography um, rising um, over the years um, 
there's always been a collecting base. In fact, I'm fond of saying that the field is a field that was started by the collectors and the dealers and the auction houses. I think that it, with a few exceptions, the museums and the academic studies came later. So yeah, that if you, if you look at the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s, you've got people who were collecting, um, you've got people who were dealing, um, but there wasn't the academic status for photography or history of photography. There wasn't the artistic status of photography amongst, let's say, premier paintings dealers. Um, and so I think the, the market, and I, I, I do think a lot about this because it is a multifaceted uh, puzzle, but a lot of things went into making photography into an art. Now, when I started at, at Swan, um, I was surrounded by people, I was preaching to the converted. I, was, I did not have to persuade people like Willie Schaefer and Bruce Lundberg and Pierre Aproxine. And, um, you know, I didn't have to um, try and tell them that this was worth this material is worth looking at. They were way ahead of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say that all of the people who came into Swan knew so much more than I did. And I learned so much from them. Um, you know, Harry Lunn, of course, was on the scene. Um, he was, he's somebody who did start in prints, but that didn't happen until the 60s or 70s. Mm -hmm. So Harry wasn't like a print dealer back in the 40s. Um, but when Harry I, is responsible for creating the model by which the photo market exists. Vintage prints at the top of the hierarchy, modern prints in the middle, posthumous prints. Right. So taking that formula, if you right. will, and right. adapting it is Harry's or one of Harry's great contributions right. Right. to our field. Right. But so, you, yeah, you, I think that um, now it's just so hard to remember, to even feel what it was like. Um, I mean, it just, it, it was a different time. It was a different world. And I will say this, that the people who were the great, who have been the greatest collectors, what I consider the greatest collectors and the greatest dealers um, were pretty much all there waiting for me when I joined Swan in 1980. Um, and I learned, they all knew more than I did. They all knew far more than I did. Um, and I there's- that, Yeah, if I can jump in, I think that's a really important point to recognize the dealers because coming as I did from a more academic and really no market background, I had expected the curators at the museums to kind of be the, the, the pioneers and the leading um, thinkers and, and uh, movers. And I quickly saw that, wait a minute, it's the dealers and the collectors yes. who are shaping this industry. Absolutely. And, this Absolutely. and Absolutely. it was a real wake up call. Absolutely, I couldn't agree that. with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. If I had a serious question about something, a connoisseurship issue, the first person I would call would be a dealer or a collector. But I think in the nineties, what starts to happen is this migration if you will, with collectors coming from new fields, design, folk art, um, looking at Curtis for their, um, for their Art Nouveau furniture. I mean, these sort of cross pollinations that are going on, Edessa Hendelis in Toronto, buying the daguerreotype of the cat. I mean, that was a magical moment to be in the room. I was not the auctioneer, but Harry was seated next to Odessa, scanning the room and saying to her, bid, bid, bid. 
and she was successful. And that daguerreotype was the centerpiece of an exhibition at her galleries that was all 20th century art and press photos. And so again, looking at these cross contexts and how someone who today is a contemporary artist, but then was a dealer and collector of great renown, looked at photography through this sort of different lens that wasn't about even the separation of 19th and 20th century, but very image dominated, very image oriented in the great vernacular tradition. Well, can we talk a little bit about the vernacular material? I mean, I think that's something that does set Swan apart, if I can say that. Um, and I do think it's something personally that Dale, you really taught me to care deeply about is continuing to push against the boundaries of what's considered auction material, you know, trying to teach and talk about how the medium of photography is vast and that things we even consider fine art material today weren't created to be fine art pieces mm -hmm. and you know continuing to sort of bring that conversation up as much as possible I think um, like sort of in the push with some of the fine art material maybe some of that is lost at times I mean I don't um, I am the young person on this call, so I will not speak to that. But I, I guess I'm. I would like to talk about that a little bit just before we have to push towards move towards questions from our audience. Of course, and let me say that uh, Lowry's were very generous in this regard, where it was, you want to try this, great idea, do it, and so looking at photo books, looking at the vernacular material. It was an experiment at first, as you say, Deb, and ways to engage new um, viewers, new clients. And I think that um, oddly, the one object that really kind of put vernacular material on the map, or maybe not oddly, was the Ansel Adams coffee can. Mm. Because there was something Mm -hmm. that was a kind of, oh my God moment. Here's Ansel Adams uh, allowing, if that's the right word, licensing a picture that when a collector called me and said, well, I have the coffee can, now I wanna find a vintage print of winter morning, I couldn't find one. So the vernacular iteration as it were, in some instances is the only way to find an example of certain images. And so the opportunity to explore anonymous, uncredited family photo albums, industrial, scientific, medical material. Medical never made my favorite, always hard to look yeah. at, but okay, I get it. Um, and recognizing there were artists interested in this material. I mean, living contemporary artists actively buying this material. And I think that it was always about finding a bit of a balance mm -hmm. because at a certain point, yes, albums were selling for five figures and even some single images were selling for um, substantial amounts. But unlike books, I think the price point of the vernacular material um, in some ways, uh, it always needed to be integrated into mm -hmm. the sales. It, it, couldn't, um, it couldn't be um, found in a separate catalog as much as I might've wanted to do that because the price point was more modest in a lot of instances. And so I think as we were exploring this genre and recognizing how exciting and, um, and again, how it keyed into visual culture as photography is changing, um, we were just looking to find that balance or that sweet spot, if you will. 
And in many sales, we did. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I feel again, like it was a thrilling moment to see albums come to market and sell in competitive bidding, um, NASA material. I mean, all kinds of wonderful, visually exciting stuff. And that the feedback we got from our clients was really, thank you. Thank you for introducing and incorporating this material into your fine art sales. Yeah, there was, there is still a sense of discovery, which I think is key factor to that market. Great. Hey, um, I'm jumping in because we're, we're just getting to the Q and a kind of time allotment that we have. I want to say what I've been thinking about while you've all been speaking is how the, the model that you've traced here. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm here for the brand. That's my job, but like the, the model of building up the photography department, um, at Swan is kind of what for me, Swan is in a nutshell. Um, we've done that again with African American art. We've seen that um, the tremendous growth of African Americana as well, printed in manuscript African Americana, um, and now LGBTQ material. Um, and I, I think one thing that really resonates is that throughout all of these new categories and all of these areas where we're kind of letting that swan creativity that the Lowry's bring <laughs> um, kind of uh, percolate. Photographs are a huge part of every single one of those categories too. So like I think about African Americana and the, the lot I think about is the photograph of Harriet Tubman that nobody had ever seen before that was acquired by the Smithsonian. Things like that and, and moments like that that really make the photo history come together for me um for the brand as well um so it's it's really fun listening um and, and kind of reflecting on that um there are we have a couple of minutes for a few questions and there are some in the q a but i'm going to just solicit if you have one and you think it's great throw it in the q a i'll take a look at it um and lob it over to our speakers deb while we're having our folks think about what they want to ask. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the sale you've put together to commemorate the Marshall sale and what um, what kind of you were thinking about while you were kind of pulling together this special auction. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's always an element of like surprise when you're putting together a sale. So you know, really pleasant way. Um, and I really wanted the auction to represent Swan. So the material that we excel at offering that I think we um, have a community of buyers for, but also I wanted to sort of draw in as much as I could for how I want the future of the photo market to look. So in 250 lots, that's really what I tried to do. So there is a lot of like classical material, like great material that people will know and love and recognize. There's some really nice highlight items um, that I think are truly rare pieces. And I also tried as much as I could to really draw on diversity and um, bring in work by you know, female makers, um, uh, and like less represented people, you know, communities so that, you know, that sort of to really create a direction for our sales. And I really want to solicit and see more of that at auction. I think as much as I love a lot of this classical material, it's a lot of like familiar male white faces. And I'd really like to see some of that broaden and expand um, in our sales here. So. Thank you. Uh, one question we got from Tim, uh, and this is going way back to the, the fact, you know, the thing that brought us here is, why is that first sale referred to as the Marshall sale? Um, Want to jump in to clarify yeah, all that? It was, it was named um, the Marshall sale because the collector who put together that material, uh, his name was Albert E. Marshall. 
Um, so that's why we call it the Marshall sale in the same way that um, when I was at Sotheby's, we called the Graham Nash sale, the Graham Nash sale, because it was Graham Nash's collection. So that's why it's called the Marshall sale. That was the name of the collector. And did you, you characterize that sale as the first modern sale of photography, which I think is also important in terms of contextualizing the sale as this bridge into the world of photography that we've come to know. Yeah, the, um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in the history of the photo market and I actually have a catalog um, from an uh, auction house in New York, um, you know, from like the, 19, the teens or the twenties, which was an all photography auction, but right. it was, it was thing, <laughs> things like photographs of reproductions of paintings um, of uh, George Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, it was a very different type of photography. Um, I think of the Marshall sale as, as Dale, as you just said, it was the first modern photography sale or the first sale to, to begin to treat photography as an art um, in the United States. Yeah. And the highlight item in the Marshall sale was? Well, it was a group lot, um, which, and so, yeah, it was a group, it was the Moybridge, the Moybridge, a set of Moybridge uh, animal locomotion collotypes. Were there 1,500 um, of them or some such number for? I can't remember, but I it can look like it up. It was almost a complete set with duplicates. So <laughs> what it was like, me, you might be ballpark right on that. That was a lot. <laughs> oh my God. And, and it sold for $250, folks. Yes. So factor <laughs> in inflation. Actually, it was 716 of the 781 prints in the set. Okay. It was almost a complete set. And, and then there were duplicates. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was the top lot, I think. With the, with the runner up being the pencil of nature. Yeah. $200. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I actually have this line memorized from the 1978 reproduction with the introduction by David Margolis yes. and the very last line of David's, exactly. um, <laughs> David's intro is read them and weep exactly. <laughs> on the prices there. Um, <laughs> That was a perfect conclusion. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I have to, I have to put in a little plug here. Um, for those of you listening, I have for years been trying to compile uh, the the buyers of that sale because the Swan catalogs are lost. So if any of you ever run across an annotated Marshall sale catalog. Um, I've been going through, I mean, I've been, I've looked at the catalog at the Met because the Met bought things in that sale. The Eastman House bought things in that sale. I interviewed Lucian Goldschmidt, who was at the sale, about the sale, and he gave me annotations from his catalog. But there is a, there is a lot of great stuff in that sale and no one knows where it is. No one knows where it went. And I used to get questions, still get questions from people saying, you know, this set of complete set of correspondence from the Royal Photographic Society. Where is that? <laughs> I don't know where it is. So that's a plug for anybody who could be in touch with me if you know where something went. That would be so interesting to, to track it all down. Um, we got a question from Aaron that I love, um, which is how has working at SWAN or how did working at Swan change your personal collecting interests? Well, if I can jump in. Do it. When I started working at Swan, I was not a collector. In fact, the idea of collecting was kind of controversial. I did not own a single Lewis Hine photograph when I was writing about Lewis Hine. And then I jump into the deep water with these crazy dudes, all of whom are like super passionate about what they do and begin to think, 
well, there must be something you can collect and start looking at these three dimensional decorative and functional objects highlighted with photos. And 3,000 objects later, <laughs> it's a small collection. <laughs> it's a small collection. Wouldn't you characterize it as such? <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't own many photographs. Um, I've picked up things here. I've picked up things there. A few times when things didn't sell at Swan, I would uh, get permission to buy them at the reserve after the sale. But um, I, I'll just leave it, leave my collecting uh, at this. I was at a show. Um, I was at a show, uh, I think it was at the National Gallery with a friend and he's, I, I forget what happened, but he, he said, uh, what do you collect? Or I said, I can't collect photographs, they're too expensive. And he said, and whose fault is that? <laughs> Touche. Yeah. Leave it at that. Leave yeah. it at that. Yeah. Um, Dale, we did get a question since we're on this topic about the uh, object of art behind your left shoulder there. Oh, yes. What and, you are, yes. I'm sorry. Um, which is just, they want, the, the, the people want more information on this beautiful uh, tower behind you. Well, as you can see, it's obelisk shaped. Uh, perhaps the detail is not quite readable, but these are seashells that ornament the armature. And the obelisk is embedded with family daguerreotypes and ambrotypes. And on the top is a bud vase. And um, I bought this from Michelle Hauser and Andrew Flam, odd fellows in Maine. And they claim that it was a, uh, a family marker of some sort, a maritime family's marker, uh, given the maritime or seashell motif. And so um, my studio in Soho um, has a fairly large number of objects. And um, I invite you to contact me once COVID has uh, minimized. And I love having people here and doing tours and again, opening the door to discovery, as Deborah said, into this genre um, that's so imaginative and wonderful and draws anonymous and named practitioners into the mix. Uh, we got a ton of questions actually when I opened up the floor and we're not gonna have enough time to get to all of them. Some of the questions we got were about printed catalogs. Uh, there is actually a, a very small limited run of our uh, catalog for this this catalog. Um, the auction is on Thursday. If you come by and uh, are very nice to Deborah, maybe you can walk away with one. Uh, <laughs> but we're 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 printing in very limited runs um, because so much of the so much of our commerce has gone online, uh, frankly, um, and that was and. That was obviously already happening, but COVID accelerated that process and really gave the auction market as a whole a big old kick in the pants on the internet. Um, and so that is where our focus is these days. Uh, that said, we're still uh, aspiring to put together really, really well-researched, uh, amazing reads. And I think Deb has definitely done that. If you look at our homepage, you can check out um, the catalog for the sale that's coming up, um, as well as some other resources and info on the Marshall sale. We also got tons of questions about um, just appreciating photographs, vintage versus um, 
you know, more recent prints and uh, how to care for your collection and all these things. So Debbie and I are going to have to talk about our next programs and what to hit because <laughs> there definitely we'll be seems to be about. demand. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I just want to give a quick shout out. We've got Christine, Nigel Russell, uh, Tobias Abeloff, um, like people who were at SWAN uh, or have been at SWAN for so, so long. And just looking down the list of attendees, it's like, uh, it's like who's who of the photo world. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming and uh, celebrating with us um, because this is just such a, it's so nice to, to hear these first person accounts of how this awesome department has evolved over the years. Um, can I just say one thing? Totally, yeah. <clears throat> Real quick, I just, I am so grateful for the experience I had at SWAN. I'm even grateful for the fact that I had to do two map sales a year, <laughs> print sales a year. Um, I learned so much in those early days. There was so much material all the time and I just that experience um, shaped my entire career not only from uh, what I learned about the material but um, how to handle material how to describe material um, I mean for for people who were punished by working with me after I left Swan and you know who you are um, you know, a book would come in or a portfolio would come in or a certain type of paper was used. And I would say, no, 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 no. This is how we have to describe it. Um, I used to drive people crazy. <laughs> and I owe all of that. I owe all of that to my years at Swan. It was a wonderful experience. I agree. There's nothing quite like being an autodidact, having an <laughs> opportunity to learn something every day yeah that's what the job was about so not many people are in that position yeah and uh deborah holding the banner and torch it's it's wonderful to see you the next generation and the job that you're doing so bravo. And you have to you have to hire somebody to replace you whose name begins with d I, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I will. In like 20 or 30 years, though, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I, you both have enormous shoes to fill, and I cannot possibly, but I um, really, I really appreciate this. I learned so much this last week preparing for this and listening to you both tonight, and I think um, this is just wonderful for all of us to hear, and I am, I am very excited. I remain excited. Denise, Dale, Deborah, thank you so much. Uh, we had one final question, which is that a recording will be available tomorrow. We'll send it around to everybody who responded to this event. So you'll have it in your inbox at some point tomorrow. Um, and if you want to continue viewing uh, shows about stuff, I will mention that Antiques Roadshow is on at eight o'clock and there might be a couple of swan folks uh, showing up in that, that episode too. It's all brand new on PBS. Um, that's my final little plug <laughs> for the evening. Um, good night, everybody. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. Again, thank you to our panelists. It was just a wonderful hour and have a great thank night. You. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Well, good to see you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Likewise.